Welcome, church. We're so glad that you're tuning in with us on our Sunday morning services. You're on Facebook or YouTube, and we're glad that you're here. We're going to ask you to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the service. Uh, number one, if you're on Facebook, do me a favor. Hit that share button. Get this out to a couple of people. You can even share it individually with people that might need to hear the word of God this morning. If you're on YouTube, make sure that before you end this video that you subscribe. Click the little bell. That's going to give you notifications of whenever we come out with new content. We're the people loving place and we're so glad that we are gathered here today over technology. Let's pray and get ready to worship the living God this morning, church. Lord, we thank you and we welcome your presence here, God, no matter where we are gathered in many different spaces, Lord, the promise is you are there and you are moving. So God, we've come to glorify you and lift you up to praise your name, Jesus, that your name would be the highest name that's lifted up this morning. Lord, may you receive the praises of your people as we worship the living God. And everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, church, let's worship God this morning.
together and we're praising God we're here together either in your living room or in this space or wherever you are you might not even have gotten out of bed yet but the promise is this that we're together right now united as the body of Christ and I think in these moments this opportunity as we've tuned in and and at the same time as you tune in you tune out you know that right when you tune into God, you tune other things out. And this song is a reminder that it's God's agenda that we need to be focused on. It's His will that, that we need to be willing to do. That we need not worry about how people feel right now or what they want us to do. But God, what do you want of us? We so, so many times get caught up. We get so caught up in this place of trying to please other people or meet expectations and I think church God has got us in this space this morning where he's asking us to remember to sit at his feet and be reminded that nothing else will do but the presence of God nothing else will do but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords nothing else can sanctify or save or or cleanse or or feel or really love or fully value or take you deep or clean what needs to be cleaned listen this morning we've come into the presence of God but what did you bring with you because here's the opportunity to set it aside and say God nothing else will do so could we just continue in that, that posture of worship as Emily leads us in that reminder that nothing else will do this morning. That, that it's not even uh, enough for us to watch a video or, or a comment, but that we've come to interact with this living God that changes lives, that, that raises up the dead, that brings them back to life, that awakens the sleeping, that brings the prodigals home, that's with us and for us. And His Word says nothing could stand against us. So we can sit in peace saying nothing else will do. Come on, church, could we worship that this morning? Could we praise that? Could we believe that? Could we encourage our soul and our heart? Nothing else will do. Come on, nothing else will do. Let's worship. Only you satisfy. Only you satisfy. Only you satisfy. Our heart.
This is what we need, God. We need you. Lord, we don't need more stuff to tangle our lives with, God. We don't, we don't need more politics, Lord God. We, we don't need more schemes or ideas, Lord. We need your spirit. We need you, God. We need to be centered in who you are and what you've asked us to do. God, bring your people back to your presence this morning. I pray right now, even as we're, we're here, that we would just, we would stay in this posture of worship saying, God, nothing else will do, Lord. Nothing else, God. Come on, remove distractions right now. Let it go. Whatever has been worrying you, whatever's been weighing you down, whatever's got you so stressed out that you feel like you can't even function, let it go and let God's presence flow in this morning. Be reminded that, that God's with you, that, that there are promises all throughout his word, that, that he's with you and he's for you. Nothing could stand against you, that, that he's your shepherd, that he's your protector, that he's your strong tower, that he's got plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Come on, speak life even to yourself right where you are. God is there with you. Nothing else will do, God. Nothing in this life but you Jesus so God we are going to give you all the glory God we're going to praise you with everything that we have God we're not going to sit back but we're going to press in we're believing that you are the God that that doesn't run low on miracles Lord that if you've done it you'll do it again that today you have something new God that that you not left anyone, Lord, stranded or astray, but that you go after your lost sheep, Lord, that nothing we've done could, could condemn us from your presence, God. Thank you that you sent your son. Thank you that you sent your spirit. Thank you, Father, that you love your sons and your daughters. So we pray to this God in Jesus' mighty name and all of God's people said, amen. Come on, church, right where you are, just give God a hand clap of praise and thank you, Lord, for what he's done and what he's doing. And and we're excited about what's going to happen in this service. We've got a powerful message that Pastor Joel is going to be bringing for you this morning. And I'm glad that you've tuned in, whether you're a first-time guest or you've been here a thousand times. Some of you watching have been here since this building was built. And the reality is that you are part of a movement of the spirit of the living God. Here at Light and Life, we're all about reaching, teaching, mending, and sending. And that doesn't stop in the midst of a scare or a virus. We're going to continue to do what God has called us to do no matter what we face in this life. God is with us. I just want to make you aware of a couple of things that you can do to get connected. Number one is you can go to our website, llcf.org. On our website, that's where you're going to find all the information about our church, who we are. You can meet some of our incredible staff. I know you don't get to see them all face to face right now. Some of them are behind the scenes, but I want you to know that there is a dream team working here, that God is really on the move and has been doing incredible things. If you want to give and this is your home, or you want to financially partner with us. Maybe you're a new partner and you want to know about how financial gifts are blessing people all around the world, literally hundreds, thousands of people in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Australia, in our own backyard. God is on the move. And so we want you to be able to partner with us. You can give online first-time gift, a tithe, an offering, however you want uh, to bless the Lord with your tithe and offering. We'd love for you, love for you uh, to partner with us as God has moved his compassion and benevolence to this community. If you need food and there's an immediate need, you can get connected on our website as well. Nikki, uh, who does our food outreach, would love to connect with you and love to serve you in that way. Church, we want to continue to be the church. The church has never closed. Though the building may have closed and the doors may have closed, we are being more the church than we've ever been. And thank you for being a part of that movement. You can sign up for a book club. There are a few spaces left. We'd love for you to go online or or maybe you want to start one. Maybe there's a group around you, a community that you'd love to get invested. Let Pastor Joel or Pastor Deb know online. We would love to get you connected with that. And last but not least, I want to introduce and welcome Pastor Joel as he comes to bring the word of God to you this morning. Would you welcome Pastor Joel? 
Hello church, Pastor Joel here, and I am so excited to start a new series today with you called Good and Beautiful. This series is gonna go along with our summer book club, and I am so excited for those clubs. You can still join one today. Hop on our website and join one of our many men's and women's groups ASAP. Well, this series is going to be an invitation for us to look at the life of Jesus and to get to know the God that Jesus believed in. And by doing so, it's gonna invite us into lifelong transformation. Well, with that said, I, I wanna say something real quick before getting on with the teaching. Uh, to say that this was a hard week is an understatement. In all honesty, it's been harder for uh, some of our black brothers and sisters. You see, racism has once again surfaced its ugly head, but this time it was caught in a gruesome, sick to our stomach video. We heard the last words of George Floyd loud and clear. I can't breathe. And you know, this is what many in our black communities and in our church have been telling us for years. We can't breathe. And yet again, our nation has reached a boiling point. You see, as Christians, we are called to be the light of the world expressed through local communities called churches. And if we cannot have honest conversations about the darkness in our communities and offer a solution through the gospel to the sin of racism, then we are saying that the gospel has no power. You see, when Jesus came into this world, he did not only come to save people's souls and get them saved and into heaven, but he lived a good and beautiful life that demonstrated the power of his message by reconciling ethnic groups that hated one another. He didn't do this so much through a Facebook post or a hashtag, but he taught about it and he lived it out. For example, the first person whom Jesus revealed his true identity as a Messiah was a Samaritan woman at the well. And a Samaritan was a person whose blood was mixed with foreigners so that the Jewish people believed that they were, uh, uh, their blood was dirty, that it was mixed, that they were racially inferior to them. And yet Jesus makes this woman the first one to reveal his true identity to. Furthermore, Jesus also tells a story where he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story and he makes people lose their minds. Why? Because the Levite, who was the true Jew of Jews, pure blood, and, and, and the priest as well, who represented the purity and the true Jewish people, they were made to be the villains the ones who did not understand the will of God, and yet the Samaritan was made to be the hero. And I could give you a dozen more examples of how Jesus confronted discrimination and nationalism in how he lived and how he taught. So, pastor, you may say, how does racism fit in with today's sermon? Well, you see, this entire series is about experiencing real transformation in our lives. And if you desire to see our church, our city, our communities, and our nation become more loving, more just, more equal for everyone, if you desire to see God's goodness and beauty, then it begins with the transformation of our own hearts. Now, it doesn't end there, but that's where it begins. So today, I invite you to prayerfully examine the areas of your life that are bad and ugly. Yes, even your own racism, prejudice, 
biases and discrimination. Why? So that you and I can exchange them for the goodness and the beauty that Jesus offers us. So as I teach you on what it requires to have real transformation, I want to offer myself as an example um, of how God has changed my life and specifically in the area of discrimination and racism. Why? Because that is one of the most important topics of our community and our nation right now. So I invite you prayerfully listen to the word of God and to the thoughts that I believe God wants you to receive today. Here's a bit about my own journey um, in exposing the bad and the ugly in my own heart. Growing up between Guadalajara, that's in Mexico, San Antonio and Los Angeles, and living for months and years in Santa Barbara and in places like Salvador, Brazil, all of those things, living in those places has exposed me to an array of narratives, of experiences and mentalities. You see, for example, in Guadalajara, I learned to hate, yes, I learned to hate and even consider evil all of those who did not belong to my church. Living in San Antonio, Texas meant that I was surrounded almost completely by people that only looked like me. And then moving to Los Angeles and interacting with black communities and Asian communities for the first time was also something that shaped my life. You see, uh, the only thing that I heard positive about the Asian community is that they were smart. And I was warned against being associated with black people. God forbid I marry one, I even heard and growing up in a light-skinned Mexican family, there were often comments or things that were taught to me that lighter is more beautiful and darker is ugly. Friends, I'd be foolish to think that these stories, these comments and these experiences haven't shaped my thinking and living. Perhaps you are recognizing some of those even in your own life. Some of the comments your parents made, your uncle said, your cousin said, your neighbor said, your friends said, these stories shape who we become. But I have to warn you, many people think that they can change themselves. They can change the way they think and live merely by will power, by desiring, just having the desire to change. And I gotta tell you that the Bible is contrary to will power. The Bible teaches us that on our own, you and I are utterly powerless to exchange the ugliness and the badness in our lives, and we need much more than will power. So, what solution does Jesus offer you and me? He invites me to experience transformation through what we call the triangle of transformation. See, when we examine the good and beautiful life of Jesus, he modeled for us what we need in order to grow spiritually and in our character. And those components form the triangle of transformation. Uh, one part of the triangle is that we need to change the stories of our minds. The other part of the triangle is that we need to engage soul training practices. Another part of the triangle is that we need to participate in a diverse community of God. And in the center of this triangle is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so, my friends, I want to invite you to consider these components as you think about the areas in your life that need God's transformation. I remember my first sermon. I was a student in Santa Barbara College up there and it was way too long and it was on Jesus' very first miracle and it was probably a thousand five hundred words long and I used a whole lot of Christianese that my audience could not understand or relate to. Like I was speaking a foreign, a foreign language and according to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' first ever sermon was only 15 words long in the Greek. 
I know, I know, I'm working on making my sermons shorter with less words, uh, less is more. And Jesus' first sermon went like this. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news, he shouted. You see, Jesus makes a huge announcement with just 15 words that the kingdom of God or the reign and the rule of God was here. In in other words, he was inviting us to live under the reign of a good and beautiful God. And then he tells us how we can live under God's good and beautiful reign. He says, repent and believe. You see, the word Jesus uses for repent is metanoia, which means to change your thinking, to rethink your thinking, to change the way that you thought and then then you consequently lived. We, you see, we come under the good and beautiful reign of God by rethinking the way we have thought about life, by repenting of the ways that we thought about life. Have you recognized that apart from Jesus, Your thinking is misguided? Have you considered that even now, the way that you view Jesus and Christianity could be myopic? You see, Jesus came to reveal a new way to live the way of God. And how did he do this? Well, primarily he he did it through teaching us Stories that revealed the new way of thinking. You see, humans, we are shaped by stories, right? How many of you are shaped by the stories that your parents told you or your grandparents or the story of America and its foundation, whether positive or negative? We are all shaped by stories. Take, for example, my narrative that I was taught as a young boy that it is not good to associate with black people Well, that can create all sorts of discrimination in my life and in my heart if I believe that story and if I live by that story. I may end up devaluing black lives and creating distrust with people in that community. I may believe stereotypes all because of the stories that were told to me about black people. So what changed? In thinking, does Jesus offer me? What change of thinking does Jesus offer you? He commands me to repent, to rethink my thinking, and then he offers me new stories to replace the old stories, the bad stories. For the story in my mind about racism that I was taught to judge people by the content of their skin, by the color of their skin, Jesus combats that story and teaches me the story of the Good Samaritan where he takes the hated, mixed blood Samaritan and he makes him the hero of the story. And he makes him worthy of praise even above pure-blooded Levites and priests. In essence, Jesus helps me to consider those whom I deemed ethnically inferior than me as praiseworthy examples to follow. And he confronts my discrimination and your discrimination. Is Jesus changing the stories that you were taught? Is he changing the stories of your mind? That is where we need to begin if we want to see transformation. Jesus' teachings are invitations to rethink your thinking and the stories that you live by so that you can begin to live under the reign of a good and beautiful God. So church, friends, learn the stories of Jesus and allow them to help you repent and believe in the good news of God daily. But changing the stories in our minds, I'm sorry, it's not enough. We also need to engage in soul training practices. What do I mean by soul training practices? Let me give you an example. Did you know that the Boston Marathon was canceled for the first time in the history of its existence this year? And I am so sad about this. I had been thinking about running, you know, the Boston Marathon with, uh, you know, I I had the belief that uh, I could really pull through and maybe even win a medal. I bought my running shoes and 
They have this awesome technology that make me super fast and the socks too. I mean, I've, I've been averaging two to three miles per week in training. I really believe I have the willpower that, that I will run the marathon and I will succeed. I'm going to do it. Also, I've been asking God to really change me and to make me like miraculously into an amazing trainer and an amazing marathon runner. Yeah. Now, some of you who know me know that I would probably die at mile five if I tried to run a marathon. Why? Because I don't train. I'm not a runner. I'm not very fast. I don't have that incredible long distance stamina to run forever. I asked my friend Callie, who's actually a marathon runner, hey, how many miles per week do you run when you're getting ready to do a marathon? And she said, oh, 40 to 50 miles a week. 40 to 50 miles, what in the world? I was only training three to four miles a week. Just like I cannot run a marathon because I have the willpower to do it, I cannot expect spiritual transformation just by wanting it. I cannot release the discrimination in my heart just because I want to be a better person, but I need to train myself. I need to put in some soul training. You see, what soul training does is that it exposes the sins in our lives as we slow down for intentional time with God and his people. You see, if anyone did not need soul training, it was Jesus. He was a perfect representation of God. He was the most loving person. He never judged someone by the color of their skin. He, he loved his enemies. He was the perfect human, and yet he still practiced the soul training practices of meditation, prayer, fasting, solitude, submission, service, worship, Sabbath, and so much more. We could simply say that Jesus was God and therefore the way he lived came easy to him. That it came easy for him to love his enemies. But when we look at how he trained his soul, we see a person that intentionally and regularly trained his soul and that is what enabled him to live a good and beautiful life, even in the baddest and ugliest days of his life. You see, the Apostle Paul knew this principle very well when he wrote to his young disciple and a young pastor named Timothy, who many scholars believe to be around 34 years when he received this letter, right around Sean in my age. And he writes this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to eight. Listen to what he says about training. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Train yourself to be godly. Notice that Paul didn't say, I pray that God would make you godly, nor does he say, hey, Timothy, try harder to be godly. But he says, train yourself like you would in physical training. Engage in the soul training practices that Jesus modeled for us. Press into the word, press into prayer, press into fasting, press into worship and Sabbath and, and, and solitude and silence like Jesus did. Train yourself to be godly and by doing so, God will reveal the sin that is so deeply embedded in our hearts and in our minds. I know I sound like a broken record by now, but if you want to experience true transformation, you also need to participate in a community that is diverse whenever possible. So not only do you need to learn the stories of Jesus, not only do you need to train your soul, but you need to participate in a diverse community whenever possible. We learn the stories that Jesus learned. We train ourselves like Jesus did, but then we press in deeply into a diverse community where it is safe to talk about our issues and our sins and our opinions and our struggles and our stories and our backgrounds and our understanding of who God is. 
Since I started working at Light and Life in 2014, oh my goodness, I can't believe that. I've always been drawn to our first time visitors. God made me a very hospitable person since I was a little kid. I could literally talk to animals and I, actually I was a little too hospitable so much to the point where a stranger because I talked to him almost kidnapped me when I was nine years old. Don't worry, I made it alive. That's why I'm here. Um, but for the past seven years, I have asked this question of almost every guest that I have met up with over coffee or face to face or on the phone. Tell me about your spiritual journey. You wouldn't believe the kinds of things that people will share with me, but here are two of the greatest insights that I've learned from talking to hundreds and hundreds of guests to Glide on Life in the past couple of years. Number one is that most people are seeking deep transformation in their lives. They've come to a point in their life where they say, nothing that I'm trying is working. I need God to change me. So they're desiring a deep transformation. And secondly, most guests after visiting and perhaps sticking around a bit, if they do not get connected to community, they don't stick around. They actually like fall off the face of the earth. And I'm guessing they might say something like, well, I tried Jesus. I wanted him to change my life, but it just really wasn't working out for me. You see, though, we recognize that something in us is deeply wrong and we may acknowledge that we need transformation. Jesus ends up failing people because they tried him on their terms and not on his and Jesus' terms for living the good and beautiful life of deep inner transformation requires us to participate in his diverse community called the church. Jesus himself, after being baptized, spent 40 days alone in the desert. You see, many of us want to do the Jesus in the desert life. 40 years of being in the desert, but he only spent 40 days in the desert alone. After that, what does he do? He starts calling his 12 disciples. He builds a community around him, a diverse community. And although scripture does not tell us very much about uh, a lot of these men, Note the diversity of backgrounds and occupations represented in the 12 men that he picked. Simon Peter, James and John and Andrew were all fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. Simon was a zealot who was part of a nationalistic movement that advocating throwing off Roman rule outside of Israel by any means necessary, even violence. In his commentary on Mark, Dr. R.C. Sprawl points out that the 12 represented the church in a miniature form. We see that among them, the kind of diversity of backgrounds that the church is supposed to reflect. Additionally, we know that the regular band of disciples or learners who followed Jesus included not only the 12 apostles, but also many other men and women, such as Mary Magdalene, Susanna, Joanna, you see, Christ's church is not made up of one race, one gender, or socioeconomic class. Rather, it radically includes men and women from every nation and every possible background. And it is into such a community that we are called and invited into. Just listen to what happened. On the day of Pentecost, when the church of Jesus was birthed, okay, listen to Acts chapter 2. It says, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Now, pardon me if I cannot properly pronounce all these ethnic groups. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, 
What does this mean? Oh, I love this passage. You see, if you want to live a life of love, of good deeds, of transformation, of justice, of mercy, of love, you must participate in the kind of community that Jesus did. A diverse and strange looking community that causes you and others to say, what does this mean? That's kind of reaction that we often get at Light of Life when people visit for the first time. They look around and they say, what is this? How is this church so diverse? How is the pastoral team so diverse? This is so strange to what I've been used to. How well are you pressing into the diverse community that God has called you to be a part of? And how diverse politically, economically, educationally, and ethnically are your closest circles? Well, there's a final and most important component to knowing the God that Jesus knew and experiencing the soul level transformation that we desperately need, and that is the Holy Spirit. I've always been a very curious person since I was young. Um, if there was ever an accident or a crime or any sort of craziness happening in my neighborhood, guess who was in the middle of it? This kid. And in a similar way, whenever anything interesting or radical or crazy or action-packed thing happens in the community of God, guess who's in the middle of it? The Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who is always right there in the thick of it. The Holy Spirit is God himself moving and breathing life-giving power into his community and producing the life change that we are all seeking. You cannot be transformed without the power of the Holy Spirit. It is he who causes us to bear good fruit in our lives. I want to back up a bit. Just before the passage I read to you about Acts and the diversity of the community, there's a section that gives credit to the Holy Spirit for producing such a diverse community. It says this in chapter 2 of Acts, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to the rest of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one that produces this beautiful community in our lives. He's the one that draws us, the one that teaches us the teachings of Jesus, the one that empowers us to do these soul-giving and transforming practices, and it is the one who produces the growth in our lives. He's the one at the center of the triangle of transformation. Paul later writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, he says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Church is a godly, good, and a beautiful life, a fruit-filled life, what you are seeking after. I, I really hope that that's what your heart desires, and that as you pursue Jesus, as you learn his stories, as you put into practice the things that he put into practice, as you give yourself to a diverse community and submit yourself to the Holy Spirit that you would be chasing after this beautiful life. But it begins with repentance and faith. We need to first repent and believe. If you're listening to me and you don't know this good and beautiful God, 
There's no fruit on your branches that you can tangibly feel and taste and see that you have experienced life transformation, not by your own power, but by the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you to take this step today. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Turn away from your old thinking and believe in Jesus Christ. It is a free gift of salvation that leads to lifelong transformation. Well, friends, it is easy. It's actually interesting how often people often want to prove that they're not racist by naming their black or Latino or Asian friends. I've seen it a hundred times. Um, but you know, when Jesus takes over your life, when you spend time with him through spiritual training, when you join a diverse community and when you allow the Holy Spirit to guide your life, you go beyond just making friends with people and you begin to create deep spiritual friendships and connections with those that look different from you. I'm so thankful for a good friend and a former pastor, uh, Christy Hines. She was here at this church working uh, for the church for many, many years, and I sat under her for three years. Now, Christy um, is, is a, 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 of Afro descent, but she's from Panama, so she's an Afro-Latina, but she grew up here in America. And so it, it was really interesting for God to place me under her leadership. And from her, I began to learn. I began to listen. I began to ask Christy, teach me about this. Christy, I need help with this. Christy, my life is falling apart. I see your wisdom and your life experience. Teach me. What perspective do you offer me? Not only that, but the Lord gave me a joy to submit to my sister who was so different from me and a person that looked like everything that I was told not to trust and not to associate with. You see, friends, when the Holy Spirit transforms your life, you begin to cross cultures. You begin to change how you think. You begin to believe different stories and you begin to reflect the love and the humility and the submission and the love and the mercy and the justice and the goodness and the faithfulness of God. This is the fruit of a life that is being transformed. Now, I'm not fully there yet. I don't do this perfectly, and I don't think anyone does, but I trust that God will finish the good and a beautiful work that he started in my own life and in yours also. Thank you so much for allowing me to lead you through this, laying out this foundation of what the rest of our sermons will look like in the next couple of months. I pray that you would journey with us and that you would learn and listen to the good and beautiful God that Jesus follows and that Jesus knew. Would you let me bless you, church? Father, I thank you for everyone that is tuned in today. I bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God, that they would press into you, Lord God, and that they would see themselves for who they really are, Lord, and that you would begin and continue the good work that you began in each and every one of their lives as you have transformed and are transforming my own life. So I thank you for them, God, and I bless them. May you go in peace, in grace, in love, and in humility, church. God bless you.